Early 1944, Nazi Germany Allied bombing raids have reduced the fighter aircraft production of German factories by as much as two-thirds. In order to reduce the effectiveness of Allied bombing, the German armaments ministry led by Albert Speer and the SS agreed to accelerate construction of massive underground factories to move production there. New concrete bunkers using concentration camp prisoners are to be built because existing underground areas, such as caves and mines, are not suited to factory production. In 1944 and 1945, hundreds of satellite camps attached to major concentration camps are established throughout the German Reich where inmates are forced to hollow out the sides of mountains or caves for immense systems of tunnels and factories to build new weaponry, such as the Messerschmitt 262 jet fighter or V-2 rockets. One such camp becomes Kaufering 4, where in late April 1945, as US armed forces approach the camp, the SS burns hundreds of people alive to prevent their liberation by American troops. However, this atrocity will not remain unpunished, and the perpetrators of the Kaufering massacre will pay for this crime with their lives. In Bavaria, two major camp systems, Meldorf and Kaufering, were set up as subcamps of the Dachau concentration camp where the inmates provided the labor necessary to build subterranean facilities for fighter aircraft production in the Landsberg area. The region was chosen in part because of its favorable geological composition for the construction of huge underground installations, which were to be insulated by 9 to 15 feet thick concrete walls. To house the concentration camp prisoners, the SS created camps near the proposed industrial sites. At the Kaufering and Mildorf camps, prisoners often slept in poorly heated and badly provisioned earth huts in the shape of an A, which were partially submerged in the soil and covered with earth to disguise them from the air. In these huts, the prisoners were exposed to both extreme humidity and merciless cold weather, especially since the earth roofs of their huts were leaking. While water flowed down into the dwellings during rain, icicles hung from the ceiling in winter. One of the Kaufring survivors, Norbert Fried, later recalled, We lived in so-called earth huts, a trench covered with a roof. There was one window and one door, 50 prisoners in each hut, 12 meters long and less than 2 meters wide. We slept on the wooden floor, one blanket but no pillow. We put our head on our shoes, which, being of priceless value, were often stolen. There were only three latrines for 3,000 prisoners, always overflowing with filth. We had to walk through that filth, go back and put the shoes again under our heads. Anyone who would lose his shoes would get the penalty of death. In the morning, when we had to get up at 4.30, we got black water, no coffee, no sugar in it. At work, we got three quarters of a litre of thin soup water with dried vegetables in it. After returning from work in an underground Messerschmitt airplane assembly plant about 8 p.m., or as late as 10 p.m., we got the soup made of unpeeled potatoes, about two halves in a litre, and sometimes of cabbage. After the soup, we got our bread. In the beginning, one-fourth of a loaf, and later one-eighth, about as much as two slices. At the camp, there were 400 dishes, bowls for 3,000, so we waited our turn at the kitchen. Some were too weak to wait. The larger of Kaufering's eleven camps each contained several thousand prisoners, the vast majority of whom were Jews. The deportees toiled in underground armament bunkers, where they were subjected to draconian abuse and executed for trivial reasons and to intimidate the other prisoners. People who arrived at the Kaufering subcamps had already been held in other camps or ghettos or had been forced to march long distances. They were therefore already very weak when they arrived at Kaufering, where they were then forced to do hard labor such as clearing trees, removing tree roots, building earth walls, laying rails, and loading and unloading cement bags and other heavy goods with little food. Instead of in the gas chamber, Jewish prisoners in the Kaufering subcamps were driven to their deaths with work from the German arms production. Prisoners had to line up for roll call as early as 5 a.m. and then walk to their workplaces, sometimes over long distances. In addition to the daytime work, there were also night shifts, during which accidents occurred easily as people fell asleep or collapsed from exhaustion and fatigue. 
Due to the frequent contact with cement dusts, many prisoners also suffered from rashes. In addition, illnesses resulted from hypothermia. There was no bandaging material or medication available, and the less resistant among the prisoners died after only a few weeks, the others after a few months. Those who were previously unable to work were sent to Auschwitz by the camp management, and after the gas chambers there had ceased their work, were transferred to the Kaufering 4 camp, which was also referred to as the Krepierlager, or dying camp, because people there died very quickly. All the Kaufering subcamps were also heavily infested with lice, and in early 1945 were hit by an epidemic of typhus fever that cost thousands of lives. Kaufering 4, where Fried was imprisoned, was located between the villages of Kaufering and Herlach, and was established in September 1944 for 500 prisoners. The population later grew to 3,000. Prisoners were forced to work at the Lager Lechfeld airfield, in road construction, and on the bunker Valnus too, until Kaufering 4 was converted into a sick camp, where prisoners were sent to die after they could no longer work. When the typhus epidemic broke out in early 1945, the camp physician Dr. Max Blanke and the SS guards would not enter the barracks to avoid infection, and prisoner doctors could do little, as they had no medicine or equipment. At that time, the camp's commandant was Johann Eichelsdorfer, who had taken charge of the camp on the 4th of January 1945. The aforementioned survivor Norbert Fried had been made a record clerk at Kaufering 4, and later said, there was a special work detail to bury up to 30 corpses a day. The naked bodies were put on a handcart, the gold teeth already removed. That was a special duty of one of the prisoners, a dentist under the supervision of the SS men. Among the prisoners of Kaufering 4 camp were also women, and they as well were subjected to killings. After the war, Kaufering survivor Riva Levy testified about impulsive hangings by a capo named Emil Mao who was also known as the Hangman of Dachau. She said, Five prisoners made foot coverings from a blanket, and for that, they were hanged. A hangman came from Dachau. Up to 30,000 people passed through the Kaufering subcamp complex by 1945, most of them Jews from all over Europe. It is estimated that between a third and a half of all the prisoners died due to the poor living and working conditions. As US armed forces approached the Kaufering complex in late April 1945, the SS began evacuating the camps, sending the prisoners on death marches in the direction of Dachau. Those inmates who could not keep up were often shot or beaten to death by the guards. Norbert Fried later recalled, Evacuation of the Kaufering camp, holding 3,000 prisoners, started on the 25th of April 1945 at noon. Some marched out, and trains took out those too weak to walk. On the 27th of April 1945, the SS, under the command of camp physician Max Blanke, set the Kaufering 4 concentration camp on fire, including the 360 prisoners who were unable to walk, to prevent their liberation by the US troops. The Jewish prisoners were locked in their huts and told they would be shot if they came out. Then, the buildings were set on fire. Some inmates burned to death in their huts, others found strength to break down the doors and crawl out to die in the streets. While some prisoners had remnants of clothing on their charred bodies, most were naked. Norbert Fried later recalled, The earth huts were burnt, and the invalids with them. I ran away before the last train left, and I was hidden in the woods. Only a short time later, Kaufering 4 was liberated by American troops, who found only 12 survivors. For Julius Bernstein, the 27th of April 1945 was the day that changed his life. His unit, the 12th Armored Division, was in the vicinity of Landsberg am Lech when it encountered what remained of a concentration camp there. He later recalled, We arrived a half hour too late. When we entered the camp, we saw what happened. The camp commander, knowing that the place was completely surrounded and there was no escape, tried to destroy the evidence. There were about 4,000 inmates and they were all locked in their tar paper shack barracks and hosed down with some flammable liquid. They were cremated alive. I was knee deep in bodies all afternoon. I think there were 12 who managed to get out. As you get older you forget a lot of things, but there's one thing I can't forget. Even as I'm talking with you now, I can smell those bodies burning. That 
I'll never forget. Another of the liberators reported, The bodies were in all shapes and conditions. Some were half burnt, others badly scorched. Their fists were clenched in the agonies of their death. Their eyes were bulging and dilated, as though even in death they were seeing and enduring the horrors of their lives in prison. None were more than skin and bones. The soldiers found charred corpses of Jewish prisoners who had been burnt alive. The US troops were horrified to see burnt fragments of clothing clinging to some of the emaciated bodies while others were naked. The soldiers of the US Army's 12th Armored Division arrived at Kaufering 4 on the 27th of April. One day later, soldiers of the 101st Airborne Division, which was known as the Screaming Eagles, arrived in the camp. They discovered some 500 dead prisoners, and in the days that followed, Colonel Edward Seiler ordered 250 German civilians in the nearby town of Landsberg to bury the bodies found in the camp. On that day, the former commandant of Kaufering 4, Johann Eichelsdorfer, who had been captured and brought back to the camp, was forced to pose in the middle of the corpses which had been laid out in the camp prior to burial. The Kaufering survivors got their revenge when the perpetrators of the massacre and other crimes committed within the camp were tried at the Dachau trial at which nine of the 40 defendants were charged with crimes committed at Kaufering. In addition, three individuals stood trial individually in German courts for their actions at Kaufering, two of them former prisoner functionaries at the camp. During the trial, the former Kaufering 4 commandant, Johann Eichelsdorfer, was defended by Captain Darwin Niles, who argued that his client was shifted to the camp as commandant after he had become too ill to serve in the Wehrmacht, the German armed forces, and he had had no influence on this whatsoever. Captain Niles also claimed that his client was an old and sick man, and was not capable of managing the camp properly. However, Eichelsdorfer lied, which was uncovered when some of the survivors testified that he had willingly participated in the physical abuse of the prisoners, saying that sometimes he would beat them up until they were unconscious. His and some other sentences were carried out on the 29th of May 1946 by American Army Sergeant John C. Woods, who had no documented pre-war experience as a hangman. He became infamous for being deliberately bad at his job to make the Nazi war criminals that he executed suffer, as they all died a long, agonizing death. The Nazis executed by Sergeant Woods fell from the gallows with a drop insufficient to snap their necks, resulting in their death by strangulation that in some cases lasted tens of minutes. The aforementioned American soldier Julius Bernstein, who took part in the liberation of Kaufering 4, later said, we did capture two of the guards there, and also two of the SS doctors, who performed so-called medical experiments on the inmates. We turned them over to the War Crimes Commission. A couple of months later, I went to their execution. I watched them hanging in Landsberg Prison after they were tried by a military tribunal for crimes against humanity. Among those who were hanged was also the former SS guard at Kaufring, Wilhelm Temple. Before his execution, his last words were, I became anti-Semitic. It is a good thing I'm being executed. I would have killed thousands of Jews. While some of those who took part in the Kaufering massacre were executed, Dr. Max Blanke, under whose command the SS men set fire to the prisoner barracks at Kaufering 4, committed suicide together with his wife in his home on the evening of the 27th of April, 1945, the day of the liberation of the Kaufering 4 concentration camp. There were many tears shed for all the victims of the Kaufering concentration camp. Thanks for watching the World History Channel. Be sure to like and subscribe, and click the bell notification icon so you don't miss our next episodes. We thank you, and we'll see you next time on the channel.